ahead of time. So just talk a little bit about our group 
And I, I'm not, I tried not to make this into a company um, sales presentation, but just so, so you, to show that we have some qualifications. We, we have been, we're, we're a part of Molex that you know is a connector company, we're, but we're the part that a lot of people don't know exists. We're the antenna part of the business. And we've been making antennas for uh, over 15 years. And the types of antennas that we've been using where we have been spent a lot of our time in the more distant past, we've worked with a number of the handset phone companies that, uh, to embed the antennas back in the days when uh, phones basically went from the uh, pull-out antenna or the external antenna to the internal antenna. And the, the companies making cell phones realized that um, the external antenna had some challenges, usability, image, yeah, it, it made it difficult for them to miniaturize the phones that uh, that, that process has taken place. And in general, the network has gotten more strong and pervasive, so they didn't necessarily need the efficiencies that uh, the way that they were implementing the external antennas. They didn't necessarily need that as much, uh, as long as they could get good quality of internal antennas. So, um, the, the basic two ways of putting antennas on, on a platform, we'll go over this again and again, is either on the PCB, SMT in the antennas, or else uh, cabling them, and a cabling is basically a way of either making it an internal cable or external, which is the visible cable. But what they were able to do is they miniaturize it. Uh, it was working with companies like us to uh, embed and put the antenna on the housing, the plastic housing. So we we uh, pioneered, we weren't the only ones, but we, we were one of the innovators of uh, embedding antennas on plastic. So we could metalize or plate plastic. You can see the antennas on the part of the frame of that um, uh, cell phone. I think that's probably, that was probably a Blackberry, I would imagine. Um, and then over the course of time, you realize that, hey, people are using a lot of antennas besides cell phones, and we're working on uh, uh, a, a regular product line that you can you know, see through and buy through companies like Mauser and, and whatnot. Um, we are not the biggest antenna company, um, but I would say we are definitely a very good one and a good choice. And what you'll look at is, 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 was this an organic product or did Molex acquire something? No, it's completely organic. Um, we, we have acquired, and there are even parts of our business that uh, make antennas, um, like we have a printed uh, or, or printing process where, where they print antennas on uh, like flex cables. So, you know, we're not the only part of Molex, we're the main part, but we actually recently acquired a part of Laird and uh, the, uh, the shark fin antennas that you see on the back of cars. So that, that part, not the whole company there, but Molex uh, now has that part of the business. Um, but no, we've been doing this for a while, and we have production in uh, Korea and China, and we have design there as well as North America. I work in our headquarters, and we have design engineer, RF and mechanical, and uh, test capabilities. Um, you can't really talk, I mean, well, when, this is kind of a, a summary slide of why we're all here, which is why antennas, why now, and it's, it's the culmination of uh, embedding communications uh, now ever more wireless communications onto the device, on, into the device, machine to machine device. And you know, I like to say that if you have a device that has a microprocessor, at some point, if not now, there will be an antenna on it. Uh, because it's just a part of the evolutionary roadmap. Because the micro is going to want to talk to other devices, how they're going to talk, and again, why are they going to go wireless? So it's just a matter of not if, but when they go to um, embedding uh, RF onto the devices. And uh, that's why we're here. We want to have devices that can talk to you, other devices, the network, and so on. And all the buzzwords, uh, IoT, IIoT, or fancy. I want to embed or enable my device to communicate. Um, you can't really have a conversation about antennas and not talk about frequency and um, uh, the protocols. Um, I like many many people where I wouldn't say it's a, a, a guilt, but I'm often you'll hear me and, and uh, notice that I will interchange frequency with protocol. Um, technically. When we're talking about antennas, all we should be talking about is the frequency. Because antennas are designed to work with frequencies. They don't care if you have a 2.4 gigahertz antenna. They don't care if you're doing Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or Zigbee. They don't care. All they are is they're just transmitting and receiving at a particular frequency. 
Now, it just so happens that Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, they use those frequencies. And uh, the FCC then uh, has reserved and provide, it has guidelines. If you are working and designing a Wi-Fi device, there are certain, um, there's a protocol that you have to follow. You, have to, you can't transmit Wi-Fi at um, um, uh, one gigahertz. It, 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 the FCC will shut you down. You won't allow, they won't allow you to uh, get certified. Um, also, the FCC has guidelines in terms of how much power you can transmit at certain protocols. There was a question I think was talking the other day. Someone asked, well, how do you transmit know, over longer, shorter distances? And it's a complicated answer, but basically, it's a lot about how much power you're putting into the antenna. There are other things as well, but um, so uh, and then we so you got the antenna on one end, and then you've got the, the uh, electronics on the other end. The electronics, the RF electronics, sometimes we call them modems. They're not like telephone company modems, but they are they modulate or they uh, they provide a RF signal that when it's coming out of its output is going in electronic format. It's all coded up and ready to be uh, broadcasted. The antenna then converts it and broadcasts it into the uh, into the spectrum, and uh, and then reciprocally uh, it, it receives it. But so the RF electronics um, basically um, create the signal. They encode and they go from your bus to that bus, uh, and then they convert the signal, whatever it is that you're trying to uh, transmit, receive into the protocol or protocols. Some uh, RF electronics are capable of doing uh, multiples, so sometimes they can do Wi-Fi and GPS. Sometimes they can't. So, so it really depends. You might have a lot of questions about it. From, from the antenna perspective, we don't really care. We have to be aware. We have to support them. But there are, there's a lot of uh, things that are derived and determined by the electronics that are powering the antenna. I'll, I'll mention them, and I'll talk about them, and point them out to you. But I won't be able to get into the details of uh, well, which is a better RF modem, uh, what if I want to train, you know, can you do this? And, and I, I would have to go looking up their specs just as you would have to. Um, so as we, then just this is kind of a summary of what I just said a moment ago, an antenna is a transducer. Just like your eyes are transducers, they convert from optical signals that they are able to uh, capture and they convert it into electronic signals and representations that your brain is able to your eye, uh, as your eyes have antennas, electronic uh, encoded RF energy into actually broadcasting, so they, they're capable of broadcasting, and it's also capable of receiving uh, that energy and transducing it into electronic energy that gets fed to the modem itself. Um, antennas can be, as I mentioned earlier, be basically one of two meta categories. Either they are Applied, they're soldered onto the print circuit board, um, and with the common types of those are um, ceramic antennas, and I've got a couple of these I'll pass along. Um, and they're probably overall these days the most commonly designed in PCB antennas. Um, they may also be um, using technology that we have where we embed the antenna traces on plastic. Uh, we call that generally MID old interconnect devices. Um, and then they also may be stamped, and I don't have any stamped here, but stamping is uh, sometimes called, you know, it's older technology. It's uh, sometimes a long paper clip can be uh, an antenna, a piece of metal that's bent and, and cut and tuned in the, in the uh, usually the three-dimensional space, but not always. Um, or it could even be a PCB trace, but it's a metallic trace of some sort. Um, you won't see a ton of off-the-shelf stamped antennas. There are some, but they tend to be more of the predefined, pre-jumped geometry-wise, because when you're going into um, stamped antennas, they, if you, uh, as, a, as we as a manufacturer, are a little cautious because we just simply like, here it is, you can use it anywhere. But if you take it and you, oh, this doesn't fit my application, I'm going to kind of bend it a little bit, or I might cut this a little bit, you'll greatly impact the performance of it. So uh, you really need to have it highly optimized so that it fits and it's not going to be disturbed or bent because it will change the performance, when meaning the frequency, uh, frequency characteristics or the gain characteristics. Um, but 
you know, Denver bus stamp is very, very commonly used. They're, they can be very low cost to manufacture. It, it does take time and energy and money to design and develop them, though. Um, and sometimes stamp can be uh, stamped around a substrate, like a piece of plastic or ceramic or wood or whatever. Um, but so stamping again is just a, it's a, a, a highly specific, and they can be very, very efficient. And then the last is flex. Flex ribbon cable, they can be soldered onto a printed circuit board. Um, yes? So, this uh, bit, yeah. what's the, what part gets lasered? Um, it's, it's on plastic, it's a, and that's the technology I'm going to get into more, a little more detail, but essentially what we are doing is we are lasering, it, and it's special plastic, and I'll talk about what that means, but we laser the surface of it, and that, that burns and scores the surface, and that makes the plas that plastic receptive to plating. We run it through an electroplating process. So we're literally growing uh, a metallic surface on there. It's usually copper, and then that, that top coat is a very thin layer of gold. But that's very commonly done. And with that, by using that, we're able to build an antenna kind of like a stamping without all the you know the challenge of being stamping and being you know bending and moving slightly. So you you have a highly defined geometry. So and, it, and I, this there's a, the sixty-four million dollar question is always well, what is the best antenna? The best antenna is the one that works the best in your application and sometimes on the um, I mean, there are, uh, you can spend a lot of money on antennas, but sometimes if you spend a lot of money, you still don't get much better results. Um, so, really, it's about how to apply. And we're going to get into more and more kind of, you know, layers of the onion about how to apply the rules of what it takes to uh, design an antenna in your application. Okay. So, the other type are cable. Cable antennas, uh, they're, they're very simple. They have, um, there is some type of an antenna element. Um, and uh, two most common ways, or at least for internal cable, are either on a like a piece of flex sand, a flex, flexible membrane, or also on a printed circuit board. These two antennas that I'm passing around are actually, I believe they're actually the same antenna. Um, what is it? The substrate is different, one is flexible, one's not. And you probably ask why, why the difference, which is better. It's what well, it depends on your application. Some uh, generally you don't want to bend or over bend. But yet, if you have a slightly curved surface, um, it's okay to bend it. So that's why the peel and stick tend to be very popular. Uh, but sometimes you might want to take the hard antenna and like put it into a, a, a slide cavity in your device, and it, it just it's easier to mount. So really, on the design and process. But in terms of performance, they're going to perform almost exactly the same. I never say exactly because there could be very slight differences, but uh, they'll perform about the same and um, so they are so it's an antenna element with a coaxial cable with a micro coaxial connector. So they could be flexible, they could be uh, rigid back. Um, the, the third one in the upper right is um, uh, antennas don't like to be placed on or around or under metal. Uh, so never place an antenna under metal. They're inside metal, well generally quite inside metal, but um, if you have to place it on a metal surface, like on a housing, uh, uh, over a battery, over a shield, like your RF shield inside of your devices, you you can we can help you by placing. Uh, we have antennas. That metal. Uh, basically, the metal is going to distort the signal. metal is going to basically pull the signal down and it will be less directed. And uh, but yet if you place, if we place metal uh, a, a right sheet, which sounds counterintuitive, but uh, because this is very highly designed and highly optimized, uh, we're able to direct the signal so that it doesn't radiate towards the metal, it radiates away from the metal. So more of the RF energy is radiating outward. That's really it in, in simple terms. Um, so yes? It's a um, it's an iron substrate. I don't know the exact chemical or makeup, but it's it is metal. Um, again, it's a, it's it's highly engineered. That's what that's what we're getting into. There are people that know more than me. I don't want to pretend to. Uh,
lot of metal. This is going to be generally lower cost. 
costs. So if you're Apple or you're, you know, you're, you, every penny matters. I'm not saying it doesn't matter to you, but often when you're starting out, you want, you want to make it work. And if, if it costs you an extra 20 cents, it's okay. Um, but this, this approach um, often provides very excellent results. Now, a lot of antennas require a main and a diversity antenna. A lot of antennas, uh, maybe your, your device uh, doesn't have the space for, for this. Maybe it's too, maybe your print circuit was too small uh, for that, for the type of your device, for the, for what the antenna, for the antenna requires. Maybe this is the only choice you can have. So there are, I, I told you a general guideline, but th things will be a little bit different with, uh, sounds like this microphone's going out of me. So, um, anyway, you, um, uh, you have choices. This was just kind of a high level, and I'll get into a little more details here. But, um, so this is just a summary um, of, the, of what I just said before. Uh, so let's let's take a look at your kind of a, a step back at the design process. Um, when you pick your application, um, you're going to pick a protocol. I'm going to use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or LTE. And once you determine the type of protocol, then you go modem shopping for our modem RF electronics. So you look at Nordic and Murata, and you know the list is long in many different places. And um, you know what is the right cost, the form factor. Um, again, that, that, that would be a whole other conversation to how you pick the right RF electronics. But once you pick the electronics, then it then drives you into a, an antenna discussion target. Um, so. It, what's the, uh, the form factor? Where would it be located? Um, you, you also will start to look at choices like, well, where should I put it in my device? Uh, how do I optimize my performance? Um, so then the engineering process begins. So one thing drives another is what I'm trying to say. We, and we talk about this a little bit, kind of over and over through this. Uh, another thing, just to keep in mind, is that um, an antenna um, can be designed to, to support more than one frequency band. Um, you know, we, we sometimes we just have, we, we, in our mind, we think very simple, like a resistor does this. An antenna can, uh, for instance, this antenna can support, uh, we have frequency, it supports 900 megahertz. This is a super Wi Fi antenna. Um, and, and, it can, and it can transmit and receive from all of them all at the same time as long as the electronics allow that. Um, so it's just worth noting that uh, they can. We also have them that support uh, GPS, and so if you have a modem that uh, needs to have a certain range of frequencies, then you just hunt for the the, the frequencies that your uh, that your modem uh, is looking for. Do you have a question? Yeah, I found a one-person shop, and I wanted to verify an antenna frequency where it's optimized. So, for example, maybe it should be 915, but it's really 898. Um, is there tools that we can use? Uh, many ways to answer that question. I would say the specifications are uh, usually the best way to look at it. Um, you, you should be looking for uh, documents that describe efficiency or gain or return loss at the frequencies that you're looking for. So there's no oscilloscope kind of thing where I can just like shut it and say. You're, no. you're going to search on paper first. You know, you're going to yeah. you know, do your spec, spec search. And then when you implement your, your device, then you go through a, a testing process, ideally, so that you actually, is it performing in the way? So you, there are, ideally, you either have you access to an anechoic a, a R test chamber. That's kind of the, the super you know, high end. I'll talk more about that. But uh, then you can take uh, spectrum analyzer some performance on the antenna um, at those, those frequencies. Yes? Ah, uh, the magic thing you're looking for is a one-port VNA. It's a spectrum analyzer and a so it injects a signal into the antenna and sees what gets bounced back. One-port VNA? Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. thank you. So you can see $100,000 or No, one-port no. VNA is only 2000 at most. Oh. A, a multi-port VNA, yeah, then you're getting it too. Very expensive. You can get a UV based DNA for a couple hundred to a thousand dollars. I mean, it's sweet. You can get a, a crappy impedance analyzer that doesn't have a set of charts for about 50 bucks. 
Very good, thanks. Um, another thing that's worth noting is uh, when we talk about antennas, you'll, you'll often hear about gain. Um, often um, you'll hear uh, maybe a specification that this is a very high gain antenna. And, and gain, lots of gain might sound like a good thing. In a lot of instances, it is because gain basically means um, how much signal it's, it's uh, propagating in one direction. Um, uh, omnidirectional, which is an antenna that radiates in 360 and all the different uh, angles, um, that antenna has very little, if any, gain. So if you think about your device and your application, you need to think about gain. Gain is a, an important parameter. Do I want this antenna to radiate everywhere? Or is it like, um, it's a GPS? and I want it to radiate up. And if it's radiating up, meaning it's going to have more of its energy or its ability to receive in one direction, and all the other directions not going to receiving, it's going to have much lower gain, meaning the corner will be bad. So if you're designing a device to be placed on top of a car, having a high gain antenna is excellent. But if you're, de if you're designing a device to be in a, in a cell phone that you don't know if it's going to be this or this way, you probably don't want a lot of gain. Um, and this is where you get into uh, modems and you might have uh, pre certified and certification, where the modem, if they say they're pre certified, uh, or if you follow this design, you, you will be pre certified. One of the parameters that they will often state is gain. They'll say you need to be at either above or below this level of gain. It depends on how they test it. Um, often it's below. which means it's not, uh, it's more omnidirectional. Um, and uh, so if you have a divide, if you have a parameter in your antenna, your antenna spec sheet, it might say the gain at that frequency is 5 dBi. Um, so that, that, if you use that antenna, it, wouldn't, it would not have certification by, by that supplier, is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, so I, I can get more into that, but what I say is that gain is a, is a parameter you should just keep in mind that uh, it, it, it defines how the antenna propagates in different directions. Um, efficiency is the single most important way to assess and differentiate a good antenna from a better antenna. Uh, a, the higher the efficiency, the better that simple. So you want an, an antenna that's as close to 100% efficient as possible. They don't exist, but there are antennas that are in the 70, 80, even 90%. So if you have a highly efficient antenna, it's going to perform better than a, an antenna that has less efficiency, bar none. So that's, a, that's if you look at two, two different products and you, your boss or your partner or whatever you're, you're, says, get me the best antenna, get one that has higher efficiency than, than your competitor or, or the, the norm or, so efficiency describes how much energy um, is uh, is being radiated versus the power supply. So if it's one to one, then it's very efficient. Um, the other parameter that's often uh, teamed with efficiency is return loss. Um, they're not exactly the same, but they are closely related. If, um, return loss describes how much energy is reflected away from the antenna when uh, when it's at its whatever the, the intended frequency. So if if uh, if it's uh, 2.4 gigahertz, uh, you want to have a very low return loss, meaning it's uh, not bouncing back, or it's coming and being fed to your motor. Um, so here, 2.4 gigahertz uh, modem and return loss is a, a minus 22, 23 dBi, and um, that's you know that's pretty good. If uh, self optimizes, this return loss will become uh, higher, or uh, and uh, it could also shift. So the return loss may be at a different frequency, and you you want to have the return loss at the lowest value at the frequency that you want the antenna to work at. Uh, I kind of detail about what are those things that can impact that, and we talk about some of the design rules, but what I want you to just be aware of is that if you do things to the antenna that 
you start to break the rules, it will, it could have the effect of either lowering efficiency, shifting, or uh, increasing the uh, return loss. Um, so now I'm going to talk, kind of change gears a little bit, and just talk about some of the different antenna types. Um, this is not so much of a sales, it's more just an informational, because you can't, you know, it's, it wouldn't be uh, a good conversation about antennas if we didn't go over the, the basic frequency families um, here. So this is a one-page overview of, of the, the ones that, that we supply off the shelf. Uh, now, there are often uh, instances that, uh, so if we look at the 2.45 gigahertz antenna, um, and that's the frequency, um, sometimes uh, it, as, a, as a design, with this uh, um, HVAC standard, this, this wireless standard that's being used by all the HVAC companies. I just made that up, but uh, there may be a, a, a like a, a Blue Dog standard. That might be the name of their, their, their standard. And you say, well, I don't see you guys. You're not supporting it. Uh, what happened with Blue Dog standard? You know, Mullix doesn't make Blue Dog uh, antennas. Um, we might, uh, and you have to take a look at, at, the, frequent, at the frequencies that that standard is requiring. So just because we don't show support of a particular protocol does not mean that that is not supported. Often a standard like Blue Dog, if there is such a thing, would then uh, use Wi-Fi, or it might just transmit onto a lower, uh, transmit into a band frequency. So what I'm saying is, if you are ever confused and you're looking at a standard, a wireless standard, and you just don't know about it, Go down to the lowest common denominators and ask yourself, or try to find out what are the frequencies that they're transmitting at. It's that simple. So back onto this um, little discussion of Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, Zigbee, 2.45 gigahertz. Uh, most popular, the most common, wirelessly enabling. I am pretty confident that you're designing uh, at least an antenna and these frequencies. Uh, very common. Uh, you know, they, there are various. Decent range that they transmit. Um, a word to the wise as you are a system designer, because this is such an important frequency or such an important protocol, and sometimes your your device is dependent upon it uh, and performance. And if it's working good, you look good. If it's not, then uh, realize that you might be doing making a perfect job on yourself, but you don't always know the location and also the performance of the Wi-Fi network or the Bluetooth devices you're talking to. You always need to think about the use case. What happens if this were to go down? Um, and what I'm trying to say is that Wi-Fi networks are notoriously unreliable. Not all of them all the time, but as a collective, uh, if you look at them, the way that they're deployed, um, the, the, uh, the power gets employed or you lose power. Uh, there are apps that dry out and MOBs inside of them on the power circuit uh, that, that die over time. So what I'm trying to get, to get you into the thinking mode is that you as a system designer should always be thinking, um, I'm going to do my very best, I'm going to make the very best antenna, but uh, realize that if this is a mission critical protocol, and my device and dependency of this, it's going to keep someone alive, it's going, we're going to run a company on this, you may be wanting to think about uh, a backup or providing multiple ways of, of transmitting and receiving. So, um, and again, I'm not, I'm not driving, I'm trying to say, as you're designing your product, realize that things aren't always what you uh, imagine them to be when you first design or, or first building your system requirements. So that being said, um, LTE is a uh, long-term evolution, it's 4G, which is turning into 5G, that's a whole other conversation. Um, they're very happy. Uh, to sell you uh, their LTE services and products, and they do a very good job um, with uh, you know, transmitting data at various speeds. Uh, there is a machine to machine uh, IoT uh, moving, they're providing very low speed, um, so that at very low, low cost and sometimes high latency, so where you can, uh, with, with some of, varying some of the electronics, there's cat, I have you heard of the term categories or cat modems, like category one, category two, category six, 
uh, it, with LTE electronics, uh, you will see a, a, a word or a phrase known as the category of the modem. So the higher the number, the higher the speed of the modem. So like a modern cell phone um, uh, is going to have a higher number, like a Cat 5 or Cat 6 or Cat, uh, Cat 18 modem. So that means it's the electronics are capable of transmitting over high speed. Whereas if it's a thermostat or uh, a doorbell or something like that, uh, a less expensive, lower speed modem is uh, probably a better way to go because you're not overbuying electronics, nor are you overpaying for the network that, that's being used. Again, the antenna generally doesn't care about the electronics feeding it. So what I'm trying to say is that you, you are making choices as you're designing your system uh, in terms of how you want to see the performance of the product. So back to antennas. Um, the antennas, again, they don't really care that much, but they, they, uh, the phone companies, when they sell you a Category 1 or Category NB, they will have different frequencies within their bands that they require that your antenna works with. So with, with uh, LTE, you need to find out or be aware of what are the frequencies that they want, and then, that, then translate those into what are the frequencies that the uh, antenna supports. So all antennas have frequency ratings. Not all LTE antennas may support the frequencies that you need. So you have to apply scrutiny to make sure that your that your your frequency needs for your applications are aligned with the antenna and the antenna is what I'm trying to say. Um, if you have multiple bands, uh, is sometimes having multiple antennas for the different oh, I'm sure. uh, if you're using LTE or Wi-Fi. Uh, sometimes having different antennas better uh, than having one antenna that works at like you know uh, you just chose the Wi-Fi oh. antenna. So you're thinking are you, are you are you basically stating that or asking that having one antenna that works in the upper bands and one that works yeah, the lower have a splitter or something like that. Or that's a design approach. I don't know if the carriers are going to be so happy with that. Um, I will say this: I, it, it, I, I'm not on that. And there, there are a lot, but I will say this, but usually the case, um, and especially, this is more when you get in the category, category, the speeds of the modems. Um, the higher the speeds, the more demanding that they are with, with that. Uh, if, you, if you go with very low speed, there's, you know, it's cat, you know, four, three, two, one, and then again, the slower speed is cat M, and then the super slow speed is cat NB for narrow band. Um, when you get into the CAT NB and maybe the CAT M, they're a little less scrutinizing and there's some self certification and different carriers do it in different ways. But all in get up the board chain with the speed they also always require multiple antennas, a main and a diversity. With the CAT NB device, some of the carriers are a little more on one is good enough. And basically, with, when they say certification, what they're basically caring about is two things. They want to make sure that your antenna isn't screwing up their network. You're not overdriving, you're not uh, at one frequency and transmitting into another band and interfering with the performance. That's one thing. The second thing that they're concerned about, even probably more for their selfish perspective, because your device is using their network, they don't want to look like the bad guy and get the phone calls if, they're, if uh, your device is not working very well. And then the customer says, well, Verizon sucks. I'm going to go to the other guy. Or they, they, they so that's why certification is important to them. But the bars and standards for the different levels are a little varying. The lower the, the speed, they tend to care. Their concern about the performance is a little less. Um, that's kind of one way of answering your question. So, sorry, what did you say? Diversity antenna? Uh, diversity antenna is just basically a second tap. And um, a little bit more about that. Uh, Diversity antennas, you generally want to have the antennas like not next to each other. The more separation you can get, the better. Um, I don't have it in this, this presentation, but I'll talk more about my which means multiple antennas and a form factor, what that means. But, um, but yeah, for, for LTE and sometimes Wi Fi, uh, you're better performing Wi Fi. And again, this you have, your modem has to support. You have to have multiple antenna I/O for um, you know for diversity. So if your modem doesn't have diversity, you're not going to just take your antenna and split it into that. 
that actually could work against you. Could be antennas for different frequency bands or identical antennas for um, well diversity antenna would be at the same frequency. Yeah. Now there are modems that will have Wi-Fi 2.4 and then also have GPS and they would be actually well they, they could be the same antenna if the antenna was designed to work at that frequency. <clears throat> I hate to be, keep saying it depends, but often it does. <laughs> um, and speaking of GPS, uh, GPS positioning system is like saying Kleenex is to facial tissue. GPS is Global Network Satellite System, um, which basically means all the positioning satellites up there are not all just the USA satellites. The USA has, has done a pretty good job of uh, distributing GPS satellites all around the world. I think they're, I mean, I don't know where it lives everywhere. I don't know if you can get a GPS signal in my Tahiti, but um, odds are you could. Um, but um, here are uh, other countries. Russia has GLONASS. Um, China has Baidu, and Europe has Galileo. And I think Japan has some of the, the Japanese ones are just over Japan. They probably are not over Arizona. Um, and uh, they generally use frequencies. They're, but they're slightly different. So what I'm trying to say, the important walk away from this is, if you are going to be doing something that's overseas or you know you need to use the other non-GPS, make sure that your antenna and your electronics have a GNSS support. So that's really what it comes down to. The second thing that I'll say is this is, this is good, and I, I haven't yet really touched on it, but I think this is a good time. Antennas are really, if you take a step back, and they're really hardware devices that enable you to write software. They, they're, they're innate software enabling devices. And a perfect example of this is there are new uh, frequency bands that are being opened up. Most of the GPS signals are uh, at L1. When I frequency, it's easy to look up, but there's L1. So that's, and, and that for um, commercial use, that you resolution of a, a meter or two. And, but there are now, New satellites, they're also unlocking some of the frequencies of the existing satellites, and they've deployed L5 and also L2. So the combination of L2 and L5, those, those two frequencies, uh, will have, or do have, very high level resolution down to, uh, down to mil not millimeters, but centimeters. Uh, so basically, this is going to enable uh, applications like autonomous driving. So you now, now, now you know that you're not on the road only on the road, you don't know where in the lane your, your vehicle is, or your, your phone is not in your house, but it's in your drawer. That type of resolution is possible. So if you're looking for that, uh, look for some of the uh, antennas and modems for L2 or L5 uh, frequencies, and then um, that will be for interesting software. And that's what I'm trying to say, is that without that hardware, you won't be able to leverage that level of software differentiation. Yes? Uh, so for the GPS antennas, um, you know, I guess with you know, the US, and the, I guess they all work at similar frequencies. Um, are these like relatively narrow band antennas? Yes. Say, like, between 1558 and 1610? They're and relatively they're narrow band, um, but they actually have to be designed for the frequencies that they're supporting. So. I mean, the way, if you looked at a continuous spectrum, you would see, you would basically look at the general lines, or maybe some notches, uh, but the effect of this is they are narrow band. If you look at the, the, the continuous spectrum. So, uh, GPS is very important, as a, a, it's, a, it's a big growing trend. Localization, uh, finding devices, I mean, there's a lot of important things. That, and uh, it's not the only way of finding devices or locating but it is a way of finding a reference to the satellite. So we have more, more conversations about what are some of the other ways using like Bluetooth and things like that. But GPS is a, it's, it's a growing application. At some point if your device is mobile or you need to know where it is, you know, you're probably thinking about putting one of these on your device. Yes? Sorry. Here, here's a GPS antenna. This patch antenna is going to be very directed. Um, it's going to be very, uh, you know, high gain. So it's going to be more—I don't want to say a pencil beam, but it's more pencil beam than a 
that are you know, blue, but we, we have them that are, we have GPS antennas that are on this, so they, they're a lot more directional. It just really depends on what, and then that, then you get your choice, I want chocolate or vanilla, you know, you tell you, you know, what, what type of antenna do you want, so, you know. Um, NFC, near field communications, this is a case of an antenna where you don't want your, your Apple Pay uh, data Comcast 
class, or am I going to just use my own network so that I'm, I'm either moving around or setting it up in my factory or you know in my neighborhood? You have to your backup network. So just be you know keep in mind that you, you can do things, you can exchange, you can build the hardware infrastructure that enables you to build your main or your backup software services by using different frequencies. And okay. yes. Um, you Yeah, now you're going to get the, the inner workings of, uh, of that. Uh, when we say 2.4 gigahertz, there are actually there are channels. The, the, it's not just one frequency, it's actually uh, it's a range of capital channels. Uh, and companies like Cisco that um, either directly make the modems or are buying a modem and building, uh, building a router or a device around that, or you, you are is your, is your interaction. You're, it, it all gets down to your motive and how are you defining that. But specifically, you know, 1, 6, and 11, say those are your best channels between 2.4 and 2.5. Is that the antenna to do that, or is it that in my software? It's your software, your remote, your electronics. So when we say, it's a frequency map of uh, 2.4 gigahertz antenna, it's not like, you know, Zero percent efficiency, and also 2.4 to 2.41 gigahertz. It's at 90 percent. It doesn't. It's not like a notch. It's more like a like this. Uh, it's a, it's a, in a sense. So it will cover those frequency bands within the 2.4 standard. It, it and then your electronics will say, all right, now I'm going to I'm going to move it up to a channel. But the antenna don't. Again, 
just realized that we're, we're trying to keep up and listen. Um, so let's take a step back uh, and, or go a little deeper and talk about I said there's some rules that we follow. I'm going to get into those rules now. Um, so this is, uh, and we can go high level or lower level, but um, so one of the things I, I mentioned earlier is the size of the ground plane. Ground plane basically means the printed circuit board that with SFT that your antennas are on. Um, a, uh, so your printed circuit board size is basically your ground plane. And the ground plane may not be everything, but it's, uh, so when we design an antenna, uh, there is, there's an SFT antenna on here. Um, we design a, a perfect PCB for this antenna. It's, it's highly optimized for this. Yes? Well, I'm just, I, I, can't remember, I, I thought it was a key value area. I thought you didn't want metal. Yeah, that's where I said the, the ground plane may not exactly be the size of the principal form. That's we're talking about. Yeah, it, it, generally with SMT antennas, they like to have a key out area. Even though we want a, a nicely sized ground plane, generally underneath of the antenna, you want to have an area that's free of metal so that it can radiate around it. And you're getting into lots of RF uh, design, but uh, yes, there is a key out area. And when we say the ground plane, we're talking PCB, and even though there is a part of it that is a key out area. So, yeah, good question. Um, anyway, we designed the ideal shape and size uh, of, 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 uh, for the antenna. So as your device, as your, as your PCB is larger or smaller, uh, it will perform differently, really not as good. So the more, when you're, when you're designing uh, and, and selecting, you're designing your product, Selecting antenna ideally is highly iterative, but usually that's not the case. So then it leads you to one of two things: either find the antenna that is best size for your PCB, or else uh, what can you do to try to minimize the the bad effects. So um, um, all print all SMT antennas have a, a, an ideal shape and size PCB. Look it up in specifications. And they, they will tell you that this was designed with a 113 by 40 millimeter board. That, and uh, if your device is close to that, then hey, you're you're in the in some good, you know likely territory. If you're not, if, if not, then you're going to you, you you basically you probably won't get the same performance. So you might want to look for a different antenna, or you might want to change the size of your print circuit board, or you can do what Apple did, which is they find ways to cheat is the wrong word, but the way ways of trying to optimize. Things. So I'll give you an example of very specifically what that means. Let's say your ground plane is too small. Um, there are ways of, um, you know, kind of tricking the antenna to make it think that the ground plane is actually larger. For instance, um, if you are mounting your board on a, you know, in housing, uh, instead of using plastic screws, if you use metal screws that actually make contact with your ground plane, yeah, that metal, those metal screws going through your board and grounding out will have the effect of making a virtual larger ground plane. That's an example of something that people will do to uh, increase the, the, the relative ground plane size. So there are things like, or, or if you have a, a battery with a metal housing, grounding the housing of the battery uh, to your ground plane can make it seem, make the antenna think that the ground plane is larger. So again, that's, I'm just trying to give you some you know, very specifics, but to a general statement is that I'll try to follow the rules as much as you can. I mean, if you've ever been done it in the next section, you're going to hear me say follow the rules. So, uh, but our specifications are, will we'll go through and say, well, the, uh, and this is, these specs here, we have usually full specs, but this, this one I'm showing um, in terms of loss, but I'm going to be also talking in terms of efficiency. So in this instance, low, low return is better than uh, higher return loss. So this is saying is that um, the uh, uh, 30 this on, on, at that frequency. So anyway, there's a footnote in here. Uh, there's always a well, what is why is this different than that? And I can't answer that. That's just the way the antenna is. So in this instance, where, where I was getting a little tongue tied was uh, I was noticing here is that so at the 4 gigahertz. This this is a, is not as good a return. Loss. The return loss is minus 10 dB, and this is a very small PCB. But interestingly enough, 
at the high ba higher bands at the 5.4 gigahertz, the smaller printed circuit board actually gives better return loss. So you might, you know, you might get away with the smaller printed circuit board and get really good performance, or that's something you may that you may actually find that desirable. That's just the characteristic of this antenna, uh, the 20306. Uh, small print circuit boards are good at, uh, at at higher frequencies. So, yes? I, I can't read this right. Are those colors the same size board on each graph? No. No, they're saying that uh, the green is 30 by 20 millimeters, the red is 60 by 40, the blue is 40 by 20. So, but, but how many are those yes, sizes? Yes, they are. Yeah, the same. And this is uh, put over here. So. Um, similarly, uh, the Location on the print circuit board, uh, and I'm going to pass this around. This uh, ideal. This is what. This is a. We we provide this if, if you ask for it. It's a, a reference board of the device um, or the antenna. So this. And, and if you're designing your, you may want to take this and place it into your uh, analyzer and compare the results of this to your device, and then you can kind of do some interesting uh, comparative uh, uh, measurements and analysis here. So that's the. Uh, Reference board. So where it is, if it is uh, in this instance, um, the optimal location is on the center uh, uh, center edge, um, or the yeah center of the board on the edge, and uh, it's that, uh, location one provides the, the highest efficiency. So we're in the mid 70s, like 75 percent efficient. If you place it in the corner for that for that antenna, it's actually more than 55 percent efficiency. So where you place it on the board has a big impact. If, if you have, and, uh, and you notice that this is a rectangle, we have had customers, they say, well, I've got this round PCB and I want to place an antenna on the center edge. Well, you're not going to get on the, on the uh, center of a circle. Uh, so either you want to take that the PCB and flatten out a part of it, that would be an active that you could do to uh, improve the performance of your, of your product if you're able to make a straight edge on your on your round circuit board so it's more full, that would be uh, a tax that would improve the art performance at maybe not much cost. Um, other things, placing metals near the printed circuit board, very, uh, it has a very profound effect. Uh, in this instance, uh, we have a center corner fed antenna and there's a distance, um, and here we measure it at our uh, for our little study here, we place a, a metallic shield like over uh, your micro or, or something. And we, we place these shields, these RF shields, these metal, to either to protect the electronics from radiation, maybe you have some very sensitive electronics that you don't want to have. If, if you have a device that's nearby that's blasting it with energy and you don't want to impact it, or else maybe it radiates and it's to protect it from radiating out and impacting other things. Either way, the metal, the, the closest of has a profound impact. So generally, we like to keep it over five millimeters away from, from the antenna, if possible. And um, so, it, the higher, the closer the metal is, the more that it affects the uh, efficiency and the and, the, and the, the, the same colors uh, show the relative distance of the uh, of the metal, how it affects the performance of the efficiency and the return loss. So you can see that as you place this. Uh, at one millimeter away, it it shifts it from uh, 2.4 gigahertz, the return loss uh, low point, uh, you know, significantly, almost uh, 100 megahertz, and it, it, there's a huge dampening of the. Uh, that's not possible. So in that instance, you you say, can you please, you know, the board layout person, can you please move that a little bit further away? That would that would really make our RF uh, uh, performance be more happy. So. That's an example. And they, again, these are these things are stated in the uh, performance specifications. Uh, matching, I mentioned that there's a matching network. Usually with uh, cable antennas, we place a matching network, but there are instances where you can. Um, but with definitely with, uh, with uh, SMT components, it, a matching network is ideal. And you might say, well. If I just put your values in there, is it going to work? Well, it will always work, but uh, sometimes you might want to change it because if the return loss is uh, off, like in, in this instance, I'll get to your question in a second. Um, here, maybe you have no choice. You're going to have to have uh, this 
shield here just that close. If you change the, uh, the tuning network, we might not be able to diminish the return loss. It might be the same value, but we might be able to shift it over this way by changing the values on the, on the tuning network. So you'll sometimes hear people say, I've got to tune my antenna. Tuning the antenna tech in its most simple means you're changing the value of the, the feeding network, those little components, and that has the effect of shifting the return loss parameters. Yes? So it's, when you say tuning, Um, remember when I had that picture of the uh, antenna with the little components on the network on the front circuit board that was feeding it? Yeah. And it's changing the values, the resistance, and the capacitance of those little S and T components. So tuning means uh, instead of using a you know 10 kilo ohm uh, resistor, it might be a 5 kilo ohm, and uh, changing the values. And it's kind of like more more salt, more sugar. Uh, it isn't, uh, so I, and this is how we do it. We, uh, I think it needs a little more sugar. We, we're, let's put a 5K resistor there. So and the then, filtering, yeah, it's, 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 but I was just basically asking, is matching the thing? Are you using this? You're on the side of matching. What's the difference between matching and tuning? Um, they're kind of the same here. I'm, I, I'm kind of interchanging the term. Matching network, meaning there is a feeding network that Antenna. So matching is probably not the correct word, okay. but um, but the tuning process means that we're adjusting the parameters of the, the and matching basically means I'm trying to match it to the point that it, it maximizes the performance. So this, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it is a little confusing, uh, and I'm sorry that we be mixing terms like that. Did you have a question? Uh, I was just going to say is that the schematic at the bottom is essentially a, a matching network, and yes, yeah. tuning would be. Right. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. Um, also, SMT uh, in the world of SMT, if you uh, it, it, just talk about, um, I, I would take even a step back. I would say placing the SMT components, uh, anything on it. So for instance, you don't want to SM, you don't want a conformal code. Yet. You don't want to place a bunch of silicone goo on top of antennas. You can, and it will work, it just won't work as good. So it's another way of diminishing the performance. So in, in a, on a similar note, if you place a big, thick piece of plastic directly on top of the antenna, you, you, want, to, you want to have a, some separation. I think we say uh, at least two, maybe better than five millimeters. Uh, you may not have that choice. Maybe you just have to do it, and that's just the way it is. So it just, it just takes that performance further down. Um, so it's just a trade-off that you have to have to consider. Um, but uh, so that you get in general, it, it's it gets into the when you remember when uh, you go up to your the TV and you touch the or get very close to it, how you know the signal, uh, the visual signal, the TV will change very significantly. It's near field communications. So in the same way, as you as you start placing objects, even non-metallic objects, very on or very super close to the antenna. It, it changes the performance of the antenna in, 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 in most simple terms. So um, now we look at cable antennas very similar. Um, we don't like it, or antennas don't like it when you place, uh, for instance, if you think, place the print circuit board or the antenna super near the housing. Now that being said, well, why not? Because you have stickers on it, you're placing it on the housing. I know we're being kind of contradictory. So in the instance of, of this, um, we actually tune them, these we tune them to be mounted on the plastic housing. And in fact, you actually will get uh, uh, not as good performance if this is just hanging in free space. So this, this actually is designed to be placed on plastic, where I think it's more like this thing. You, we kind of want to have this more in free space, but not on plastic. So yeah, I, I haven't even, I didn't think about that when we were looking at this, but um, and so, and, and this this means both on plastic, like on the on parallel, and then it also in this next uh, slide means like uh, at a ninety degree angle. Yes. Uh, does that um, with the cable antenna? You want the cable the antenna to be as far away from the PCB? Good question. Oh, I think, uh, did I talk about the PCB? 
No, I didn't talk about it here, but uh, I think we'll further it. I do, but uh, yes, you, you don't want to place the uh, the cable antenna on. You want to have, I think, at least five millimeters of distance away from the printed circuit board. So you, with cable antennas, uh, don't like tape them or, or place them directly because basically the print circuit board is a ground plane, and you don't want to place this directly on a ground plane. It's a piece of metal. That's that's not what the antenna makes of it is. Um, just a quick little digression in the world of connectors. Uh, uh, cable connect, cable antennas get you know, connected to the printed circuit board through some type of a connector. Uh, the most common for small devices is a micro coaxial connector, often called a U dot L. That's the, there's a one of our friends in the industry has you know that's their, their product brand family. Uh, we we sometimes call it the same thing, but um, but they're. They are actually U.FL. They're actually different size, different shapes, different sizes. Some of them, they're even some that have locking, but for the most part, they're designed to be made at one time. Um, yeah, be careful, but they're very. Some of them are extremely small, um, but they're they're very effective. They're they're pretty uh, lossless. Uh, another type is the SMA, which is uh, it's a, a threaded coax connector, very commonly used. Um, they're, both of those are, are usually pretty low cost. Um, they tend to be a little more uh, meaning they're designed for multiple um, insert removed. They tend to have uh, waterproof uh, characteristics or protection. So um, BMC is the same as an SM um, as an SMA, but it's got a more of a, a press and, uh, and twist. So they're like a lot of the cable. TV, that, those types of connectors, they're a little more consumer friendly. And then uh, Bakra, I don't think I have one out, but I can get one if you'd like. That's a little, it's also a coaxial connector, but it's got a plastic housing. It's good for kind of a blind bait fit. They, they lock, so it's a locking mechanism. It's a press and lock. They're, they can be keyed so that, and, and colored, so that uh, you know, different ones will only mate with others. They, they tend to, there is waterproof features. There's a lot in the automotive industry, uh, and there are also old things like the consumer, like, like washing machines, if they're running on an antenna, it where it's jiggling and uh, it, it has locking characteristics, so it won't, it won't lock the vibration. They're, they're the most expensive. Um, they tend to be north of a buck, um, unless you get into super, super high volumes, where the, uh, the micro coaxial are super cheap. So. Again, it's a uh, you know form factor. What's the ultimate choice that you need? Yes. So, is Fakra is that training? I think, I think so. But it's it's kind of like everybody says Kleenex or uh, uh, UDL. But yeah, they're, they're actually I think there's we we make some. I think we have a partnership with that company that makes some. But you will. I mean, they're they're. I don't want to say they're knocked off, but there's a lot of you know things that. Right. And then I have a question. Do you know yeah. any companies that can sell you these connections? I mean, they can, can sell them. We sell them. Yeah. yeah. But, no, we, yeah, we do. But we have a part of our business. But um, honestly, you know, you want to pick the best connector that you that you can, the best performance, and, and shop for a good price. It's that simple. Um, well, earlier, I was going to get into why you use an external antenna. Um, the external antennas are. Uh, the, are good to use when you have that is uh, a metal housing, and you need to get that signal out of the metal. And uh, so the old cell phone uh, highly optimized. Um, but if you've got a, a metal box or your your antenna is going into a rack uh, and it's in a bunch of metal boxes, then So there's always trade-offs. Um, also, you may have a situation where you've got an internal antenna, and may, maybe you wanted an external antenna for diversity, or vice versa. That may be an instance. Uh, and generally, um, antennas, the larger they are usually, generally the, the better they are, the higher the performance, and there's more room to optimize the performance. So if you have a small device, having an exterior antenna, because it can be larger, Give you better performance, but 
why you don't want to use them is uh, they're more expensive. They're always going to be more expensive because you have more material. They're going to be anywhere from 50 to hundreds of percent more expensive. There's the perception issue, you know, it kind of looks like the old cell phone, oh, we've got a rubber ducky antenna. Uh, and then also, uh, external antennas are prone to, you know, mischief or misfortune. They can be broken, um, hacked, or whatever. So uh, it just, again, it really depends on your device, your use case, on how it's being used. Uh, a few other uh, topics. Don't over bend the cable. It's a coax. Coax doesn't like to be highly bent. Uh, you also don't want the, the cable to run super close to the antenna. So if I if I bent this and then I ran the cable over the antenna, that would be a very uh, bad way. Uh, taking the coax and like literally gluing it or running it right on the PCB or even on the ground um, on a ground plane. Um, between antennas, like uh, you know, two Wi Fi antennas or two cable antennas. This is all cable means massive input, massive output. It's basically a fancy way of saying one antenna is good, two antennas is even better. Um, and uh, basically the, the, the idea being is two different antennas, especially if there's some spacing, are going to transmit at slightly different directions, different reflections, and, and different get to their end. You're going to get a better, uh, better performance. Uh, MIMO, in order to use a MIMO antenna, they, they basically they've said, well, we're going to separate your antennas. We're going to put them all on one package. So there, there is a tiny bit of separation, but not a lot. But, um, but you'll see antennas like, uh, uh, right, like this, but it would have two or four cables on it. MIMO antennas. That means a couple of antennas in a package or a couple of antennas you know, closely together. That's what it means in the antenna world. We're talking about Wi-Fi, 5G, you'll hear the carriers talking about fans, MIMO, arrays, what it is on more on the network on the on the It actually has kind of a second, deeper, more significant meaning. MIMO basically means because I have multiple antennas, I can vary my electronics and I can transmit at slightly different frequencies, slightly different phase, slightly different timing. They can vary these parameters. And they're able to uh, uh, create a very direct uh, and uh, they, there's some complicated uh, uh, algorithms. Basically, if I was going to transmit to you, I could determine that this is where you are, and I could create a pencil beam type of uh, wave pattern so that I'm transmitting almost all to you, and uh, so that way you're getting a very strong signal, and uh, and you would return it back to me, and then basically. All this other area around us, there's not a whole lot going on. Um, and the carriers speak. And, and they can share that. So they can increase the efficiency of their network. That's why the carriers love MIMO and uh, uh, Beam, Beam. So they're going to get more money uh, to use their network for, and make more money from it for the same electronics. That's why the cell towers increase more. That's really what they're doing. So MIMO to the, that means much more than I've got a MIMO antenna with two with two cables on it. Um, so I talked about the distance. So let's talk about custom. We're going to get a little more informal here. Why do you want to customize an antenna? Uh, customizing an antenna can be as simple as changing the length of the cable, um, or changing the connector, or you come to us and we. we you're, you're doing um, LTE and you're trying to hit band 13, which is a, it's in the 700 megahertz. It's a, it's a fairly low frequency. And we, can, we might want to shift the pattern or change the pattern to optimize the performance so that you can get past your certification. So that would be an example. Those would be examples of customization. To, have, to customize it, as 
as a manufacturer, it takes less time and energy and money. So we need to buy in order to justify that. And buy in to customize semi probably uh, over 10,000, you know, maybe more multiples of 10,000 circuits. That's what, if you want to customize, you kind of need to be at that level. If you want to go full custom like this, where you're we're literally creating a new part and from ground up, you need to be in the hundreds of thousands of units. So I'm just, you know, levels. Now, why are you? Well, with this, the Sullivan guy here was able to sneak in or apply an antenna into their housing that they were all paying for um, and, and free up space on their board. And it was highly optimized for their, their they don't have to worry about placing it PCB on the corner on the edge, all that's been taken into consideration when we work with them. So um, that's what customization can mean, kind of anywhere in that continuum. Um, again, these are general these are general rules. Sometimes you can get away with less volume, but that's kind of it. It's conversations are always free. We we're very happy, and not not just the Molex, but anybody that's in the industry. You might learn something from it. So don't be afraid to hire and ask them, you know, have, ask them about this. Uh, it's a discovery process. So just a few, so what, what would a custom antenna look like? Um, so there's a couple of companies that laptops there, because laptops they're they're metal monsters. Even if they don't have a metal house, a lot of them do, there's tons of metal in them. So getting good performance um, on these is challenging. So for instance, there's a, one of the Laptops. We were able to work with them. We came up with a very clever way of embedding an antenna in part of their seam where there was not metal housing, space between it, so to speak. And uh, we had an antenna that had their seated. Uh, um, these things can happen now. And, and there are different ways of customizing. It could be standard. It could be uh, um, here's a couple of examples of, of custom. That's a uh, there's a flex speed uh, old antenna. This is a LDS, which I'm going to talk about more where we're printing on. This is uh, this one into I believe a cell phone. Um, and then here's another custom. This was a, a wearable uh, watch face. Uh, this was an LED that was placed inside this antenna that uh, cell frame. Um, so that's an example. Those are some examples of custom antennas. Um, you know, obviously the cell that I mentioned earlier here, that uh, you know, a cell phone is the amount of antennas that go into these is just astounding. You've got LTE, a main diversity, Wi Fi, Bluetooth, uh, of those, GPS, NFC, um, you know, there can be other things. There's also the uh, uh, charging coil in the back, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of RF going on in these uh, cell phones. Today. Another example of some. Custom or semi-custom, we had a company that was working on a, uh, a pallet for a pallet design for tracking devices as they moved around you know, the region. And, and, uh, they had a very small printed circuit board, and uh, you can see there's a LTE antenna at the top surface of this. And the challenge that they had was they really couldn't make this board bigger. And, and this PCD was undersized or suboptimal for this. So what we did is we helped them. Just say not in a bad way, cheat in an optimal way. Um, we, I don't know if we opt if we actually, but I know we did some things like making some stamping, so basically some wings and enhancers that uh, allowed the ground plane to seem larger than it really was. So we helped them uh, improve their performance, get certified, and get to what they want within, within their limited uh, uh, pallet size. So these are things that uh, you know, customization can get you. Another application in the automotive world, uh, more and more antennas even inside a car for entertainment and we have embedded some antennas that fit on the side. Um, a lot of the housings are metal, so we work with the we changed the shape, the size of the antenna. We uh, negotiated with the automotive uh, supplier to create cut So it didn't have to radiate through, it actually was on the outside of their metal box. So again, these are, these are they, 
I think they originally, these holes were there, and they said, we just want you to strap on the antenna. And so we, we mutually agreed on that, that, that this was the best approach. So we're getting the here of uh, the antenna part. Uh, the antenna, as I said, is uh, you select the frequency of the protocol. Uh, you go, uh, you you make a selection on the modem. You design your antenna. You select an antenna. You design you uh, design it, and then you go through a testing process, or you should some type of a, hey verifying that you make good choices. Um, and then there's certification and. So what that means is, uh, you know, kind of going back to the beginning, understanding the variables is very important. Um, you need to really take a step back and understand how people could be using your device. So an example here is, uh, or two examples, a wearable watch. A wearable watch is going to be worn, and you need to take that into consideration. So when you put this wearable on, on, your, on the human body, there, you know, your body certain RF characteristics that it would, if you were to test it, you want to test it on the equivalent of a human hand and uh, you know, the, with all the attenuation and, and how the human body would impact the performance of this watch. Um, but on the other hand, uh, and the radiation pattern, on the other hand, like a, a consumer electronics has a washing machine, there are manufacturers that uh, they're concerned that um, the performance of their, their you know, Good for RF performance, you might say, Well, why do we? Why do I? Well, pretty much everything with a microprocessor is getting an antenna, but they may have really important reasons. Maybe they have uh, overload protection or still, if this is leaking water, you know, and they're selling and marketing it at, at that. It may actually be a, an important characteristic for, for their, you know, their strategic goals. Well, this is a big metal box, and if you place one antenna on this metal box, it's going to radiate away from the metal box, but if you place only one antenna, it's only going to radiate in that direction. So if you place this in a, you know, in the type of home that it's probably going to be placed in, that metal box could be in the basement, it could be on the second floor, it could be in the kitchen, the kitchen could be on the edge of the house, the center of the house, uh, the, the back of the house. So you know what that's going to be. So if you, when you're designing an antenna, you might be thinking, oh, in my house I have a washer in the, in the laundry room, which is in the back of the house, and you, you forget that, uh, and you think, well, I'm just going to place the antenna up here, it radius forward, so radius in the front of the house, that's, I've done my job. But in reality, many houses, the router may be in the direction behind or below. So what I'm trying to say is that these guys figured it out, and they said, I, I actually need to place multiple antennas on this device because it's so big and so much radiation going on. Then some of their competitors, they just they don't care. These, these guys make a marketing advantage because they thought through the use case and they're they were able to brag and say that they have very reliable RF performance. So what I'm saying is think through your device. You know, how could it fail? You have a countermeasure comfort to uh, address failure mode that could take place when you uh, when you uh, design the, the system. Linear antenna, um, you know, make make Try to make the optimal choice, the right circuit board, or the, does the antenna match the circuit board? Uh, are you following the rules? Yes. It's kind of a standard expectation on how much It just so depends. Um, it, and it really translates to um, what do you expect, how do you expect the device to perform? So, with, um, are you do you want to transmit over long distances? Do you need to transmit in multiple, multiple orientations? Uh, do you need to transmit all the time, or can, can an occasional brownout or a loss of signal, is that okay? Like if it's a smartwatch, probably okay that I don't transmit all the time as long as I'm transmitting some of the time. Um, so a low efficiency on a smartwatch is probably acceptable, also given that it's a really small device, whereas a uh, you know, a TV, a smart TV, you don't want your TV dropping the signal. So it, it depends on the size of the device, the user and the application. If it's a carrier, if you're a Cat, cat 6 modem, it better be real good at, as opposed to a, a road sensor to set to, or counting cars. 
you know, if you give occasional brownout or something, they, it's probably not a big deal because it will just, on the software, you should be able to have some error correction that says, all right, I missed it. Instead of 1,000 cars, it's 1,010. Probably not going to matter. So I can't really answer that question, uh, but low emergencies, uh, some of the uh, IoT devices and CAT and V modems efficiencies and the low teams is very acceptable. Whereas, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, AR, VR, you, you probably want efficiencies in the, you know, well north of 50%, you know, more along the lines of 70%. It just, it just so depends on the application. So. I mean, if, if we wanted to talk about medical devices, then I would say you need to be above 70%, but I just... Uh, well, yeah, you do have all partners, yeah. but I just have no idea. Yeah, but, but, self, but uh, in the team, the efficiencies in the teams can be wonderful if it's a, if it's a device that, it, that might mean that I'm going to get a signal 80% of the time. That's probably pretty good for, for a smartwatch. Yeah. So. Uh, then you want to measure... Oh, go ahead, yes. So this, I don't know if you mentioned it, but like, um, like how how important is it that the actual PCB has the right characteristics? Right? Like a, well, the, the more that you vary from it, the lower you as you as you make this round, as you make it smaller, as you make it much larger, it will you know it will diminish. The question is, can you tolerate that? I, uh, I mean, like actual physical, like what what the PCB is made out of. Like if I wanted to put it on a, a flex. If you have a run plane, it's and I, again, this, I actually have a situation where there's a, a device in a, in a suitcase that has a ground plane, but, and the print circuit board is very thick. I think in that instance, the, the thickness of the print circuit board actually works against it. Um, but I guess, I guess the answer is we probably need to test it. I don't know. Um, okay. I don't have years of experience in that specific question to be able to answer. And I guess that's a good segue to testing. Um, you, you build it and maybe you don't have to have a production process, but try to have as much production material, especially housing and print as possible. Uh, so, for instance, if you're testing, if you're making a device that is uh, doing weather sensing and uh, it's outside, and you're, doing, you're testing it with uh, uh, SLA material. But yet, the device that you're manufacturing is going to have this very highly optimized resin with UV additives in it that are actually RF opaque. And, and you and you say, and you say it's great, it's awesome performance. And, and then when it comes to the real world, it actually doesn't have a patient. The problem is when you did your testing, you, you weren't using the same material. So when you're doing, you go through your testing process, try to production and time as possible. Uh, so testing, you know, it can be more of an internal, uh, you know, you can start with some um, RF modeling using uh, HFS or some type of a, um, an antenna modeling software, uh, or using a analyzer. Ideally what you're doing is you're actually testing the real part in a, in a chamber, an uh, RF test chamber, actually testing the performance. Uh, so you may not have access to it, so you can talk to Molex, but you know, honestly, I mean, and we, and we, we can, we, will, we wouldn't be happy to talk with you. Um, an expert, to have a conversation with an expert, uh, conversations are always free. Um, just to level set, typical test tune process, as long as we're not talking highly iterative or whatever ending project, uh, it's typically a couple days worth of work, and uh, the amount of time uh, that building a fixture to take your device and put it in, we have a conversation with you, we test it, we might have to move or tweak it. So again, it's a couple days. And that translates to if we're to hire a company like us or other consultants, it's usually a few thousand dollars. That's what the bottom line is. It's not it's not hundred dollars, it's not a hundred thousand dollars, but you know that's the price to pay. Or we have you know monitor, I mean some there are experts that are available for hire to, to bring but it will give you data points that could be very useful down the road. Um, and then you have a certification. I'm not a certification expert. We don't certify. There are certified for various uh, um, you know, your various needs. 
The FCC generally has certification guidelines, so it's the pre-certification modules. Um, if you take your phone, if your device is using LTE, the carriers are going to have their certification requirements. Um, and again, as, as I said, their basic the two concerns are, are you putting their network, you know, of it, or making them look bad? That's really what they're concerned about. They want to make sure that um, your device isn't causing their, their subscribers Editor, and, or that you're causing damage that, that's making the saying that go through. So that's it's, you know, are you over transmitting and, and polluting, or are you not doing what they expect in order to for them to use their network? Uh, so taking yet a further step back up, um, when you design your device. And you're wirelessly enabling it. Usually, your your early, your first generation is like, ah, we made it wireless, um, and it's the uh, and you might do a really good job. You might uh, that has great performance uh, and it does what I need to do. But what may happen over the time as you get more users, you may realize that certain circumstances are something. maybe you didn't think you didn't think about the back of the washing machine. You think about the power going out, whatever. So you will inevitably get feedback from your community. Gen 2 is usually the act of improving, making improvements to your, your first generation wireless release. So you are optimizing wireless performance. You're adding a backup network. You are uh, increasing, decreasing the gain, increasing the efficiency. These are the things that might be done. You might be cheaping it up. You might be finding, all right, it's really good. Now let's make it cheap. These are the things you're going to be you're going to be going going towards steering towards some goal, and Gen two and three also gets into well let's let's add GPS let's add a backup network. So it basically this, this is the worst development life cycle that you will be going through. And if you're in Gen one, just realize you're really happy to get it working. You probably aren't going to worry about making it super cheap or adding a backup network. You just want to get it out there, and that's, that's very understandable and respectful. So. Um, so um, what I, you know, I talked about kick our guys, talked about documentation. Get to the documentation. Go, to, you know, basically the pathway is website, product page, and then uh, find the app. With Molex, we have the document. We have a, a part spec sheet, a product spec, and then the application spec. That's the golden document. That's the document. Here, center, uh, corner fed. Uh, here's the efficiency. We have ours, our competitors do too. Some are some of them are more you know easier, some of them are more difficult, but again, I encourage you to get that specification document, get it in your hands as early as possible. Uh, if you do it at the end of your design, it's a lot of the consequences. Uh, you know, get yourself access to an expert if you if this is an important project, even if you don't use them, having them available, have that free conversation. Uh, again, that's it's Save you time. Time is the enemy of all development cycles. So uh, you know, think these things through earlier than later. You know, if it's if it's a week before certification, you're realizing you're like, I don't know if I'm going to pass band 13. That's not the best time to call the expert up and to start looking at redesign. You want to be doing, having done that earlier in your development process. Uh, keep antennas away from the, uh, antennas. Don't like to again a very specific instance, but. Um, uh, if you if you have one of these antennas and if you have a big display, don't place this right behind the display and expect this to radiate through the display. Uh, don't place this behind the display, expect it to radiate through the metal. Um, let's see, uh, antenna tuning can make a big difference uh, down the road. And again, how do you know it's tuned? Either you feel smart or you find an expert to help you with that. Um, you want to keep your 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 cable antennas away from the print circuit board if you can. Um, maximize the difference between the and again, if you, the antenna you're using isn't meeting your goals, there is a lot of choices out there. You know, I, I hope it, it turns to uh, our company, but again, you you at the end of the day, your performance works is a reflection on your product, so it, it's a lot up to you. So bonus material. Um, I told you I'd tell you about this technology, uh, MID, molded interconnect devices, and this is a fancy way of saying we're, we're plating, electroplating, we're doing something that's not easy to do, somehow 
bonding metal to plastic. And this is the this is the the, the mystery technology that we've been using to make cell phone antennas. But it is actually very useful for many other things besides antennas. Um, we are able to, by having this clever way of uh, bonding uh, metal to plastic, we're able to do many different things besides making antennas. Uh, so how does it generally work? It is a process of uh, This is not a printing on plastic. That's another topic. But uh, it's a little more, uh, let's just say, better performing than printing. That's really what it is. Because you're literally high, it's a high, uh, very high adhesion factor. Uh, if, if you run your fingernail over these traces, you're not like off. This is not like a, a, a light. Uh, actually, it's channeled into the plastic. So we, the way that it generally works, yes, is the most common or common type. Um, LDS, laser direct charging. So we start with very specific plastic that has some catalyst in it, uh, impurities, kind of like uh, doping agents in, in the world of uh, uh, silicon um, uh, semiconductors. And we then activate it by hitting the surface with the laser. We burn the top of the plastic in a very controlled way. We define patterns on the laser uh, or on the surface, and, and that scores the top of the plastic, and we create little channels in the plastic. And uh, when we do that, it activates and exposes the rest. It's also a coral-like surface that's kind of bubbling and festered. And uh, that area is very receptive to light. So if you run this through a plating bath, a chemical bath with suspended metal particles, uh, they will magically. The other parts of the plastic will touch it, but they won't they won't stay connected to it. And uh, we can then layer create layers of this. We can grow this multiple uh, layers and we can uh, you can get Maybe not super, but they can they can uh, they can act just like plating like of uh, you know sub ounces on copper and uh, conduct electricity. Uh, whether it's signal, I wouldn't say power like you know amps, but it, it, we can uh, define electrical pathways that can be used for various uh, conducting paths. So it, it's great. Um, we can finish it off with gold. So they can be very thin pathways, it can be thicker. There are applications where, um, uh, this is an example, this is a security shield. It's an anti-hacking barrier for uh, people that want to physically hack into a device with sensitive electronic uh, card information. Uh, that has been a, a, an approach that's been used by uh, some of the uh, uh, by, by drilling holes into the electronics and probing onto the, the sensitive parts of electronics. So what this does is it does prevent it, but it detects it. And then if it, if it is detected, there are electronics that are underneath of this shield that will, um, they're basically running uh, a current through this and we're, they're measuring the resistance. So if you drill a hole in this coil, and uh, they, they then detect they said they determined that there's been a hacking event and then they activate a kill circuit or send a message or do something. So um, it's very small, it's a 0.1 millimeter tracing uh, or, or thereabouts. Um, that's an example of, you know, it's not an antenna, but it's using the, the technology that we use to make antenna to do something interesting. So you'll notice on that there's a it, there's no there's a three-dimensional going up the side. So with LDS, we're able to take advantage of the pitch and the trace, uh, the pitch and rise of the plastic. It's a, a lighting element for automotive or interior lighting. Uh, again, that's all metal and plastic. You know they're passing around. It's actually SMT. We're capable of, if we, if we pick the right plastic, this kid, no, it's important to know the application. Temperature, if you're going to reflow, and if so, what temperature we can create select the right plastic that will pass through reflow. So LDS um, is a technology that, it's like that enables you to uh, solve or address challenges. Um, generally, the smaller the part, the cheaper, because it is more expensive plastic because of those elements that are in it. The we have to go through, they add cost. Of that, that, that part, that first part I passed around, that's a steering wheel rotation for the automotive industry, and it proved 
be either cost or cost neutral would be the standard approach if you looked at the stack up of having to have a plastic carrier, a little PC, a sensor, a connector. We were able to embed all of that onto that part and uh, clean up the process. And the bonus was there was no manual labor to it. This was all automated. So they didn't have, uh, you know, the, it reduced their PPM parts per million failure rate. So that approach enabled to us to help improve the quality without adding expense to the manufacturing process for, for that for the automotive uh, supplier. Um, I mentioned that, you know, I said LBS is kind of like saying the cleanest, um, you know, it's, it's the common, but we, we at Molex, we do this for the Variants of that of that process where we're using different materials, slightly different processes, processes that rather than using that style of plastic, we can use, uh, we can use little fixtures and screens. And you'll notice that this idea up here is in place, it's kind of rough and not so shiny. This is very shiny, almost cosmetically beautiful. Because we use a different process. So uh, again, we can we can use different material. What I'm trying to say is if you ever get into a situation where you want to use LDS or MIB, it does happen. sometimes you'll say, well, I don't use LDS because it's really expensive. Um, you have a process that, that can be on the material side, but it might be a more expensive process, but if you add it all up, the other process may be a little bit lower or maybe more optimal. We have uh, we've been doing this for quite some time. Within my, the team that I work with, um, we want to do this. What is the process? And we work with them to determine that. So, what, where I'm going with this is these MID applications can be very useful, as, as I mentioned, for antennas. They can be used for three dimensional interconnects. So like, for example, an interconnect, uh, there's a company that has been using our product, and now I'm working them into. A next generation pacemaker. It's a three dimensional part of the plastic to be an interconnect for some of their conducting surfaces. And that surface is the size of a smaller than a pencil or a razor tip for a mechanical pencil. And that's for a pacemaker that will be a superior femoral artery rather than having to cut your spread ribs open. Uh, it, it's you know, a much less invasive medical procedure. That wouldn't have been possible without technologies like. That can help miniaturize the interconnects or that lighting application. That was all done with uh, SMT automated process rather than having hand assembly or, or these are all SMT on, on that, um, component. The LDS took advantage of the uh, three dimensional plastic and we could create the security barrier. So uh, also it can be used for small device packaging like uh, sensors, MEMS, MEMS packaging. So, I, I, I'm not here to sell you a, a, a part of this to inform you of the technology that is available to you as a design process as you go through your, you know, your, your ventures and uh, you know, for you to take into consideration or at least be aware of Are there any questions? Because I pretty much have covered everything in five minutes left. <laughs> and you guys have been very attentive. Thank you for not, uh, not uh, walking out or, or falling asleep or... Happy to answer any questions. Um, I have cards. I'm very happy to share this PPT. Uh, I think it's available. I guess uh, we've been on the here, and uh, so this will be a part of the permanent record. And, and, uh, but again, I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, would invite the opportunity to keep in contact with you with uh, you know to follow up on this or any antenna or MID related uh, uh, questions. Yes. So, question? Yeah. Uh, I think earlier you said you were looking at putting copper. Yeah. Is that the only metal that's in that? Um, copper is usually the main conducting layer. Uh, it's the seed layer, uh, and it also, uh, but then we can top finish it with nickel, uh, uh, silver, gold. Yeah. I think there's tin sometimes, but uh, I'm not sure about that. But you generally, you generally do first layer of copper. Yes, that's usually the seed layer. Yeah. And then I take it the plastic. Has certain characteristics that you guys have to control. Yeah, there, but the good thing is, is there's many grades of plastic, everywhere from uh, poly.
polyesters to LCPs. So it's not just one plastic. No, no, not at all. And um, actually, LDS is actually pioneered by a German company that's it's a partner of ours, but they, there are other companies that do this besides them. But they own the process. They basically will, uh, a plastic supplier says, I want an LDS enabled, so they'll work with them, give them that, that catalyst to place in their resident. And they, they experiment and come up with that. And then, so they, they license it to the, the plastic company they, that we have that we have to buy. And then we, we have to use their lasers, it's very, very special lasers. And I think we pay them a royalty for using it. So like I said, it is a little expensive, but, um, uh, but like I said, there are other versions. But we, uh, there are, in the medical world, there's medical grade versions of LCD, or medical grade of uh, the resin for that. So it's, it's transparent. Lots of different places. At, at my company, we actually had an intern. I was really a 3D printed structures. Yeah. Yes, I don't know. I just wanted to get all the into added. You want to, like, free or low cost the education in our products and more than understand, you know, like, a ground plan, how a ground plan affects things or RC circuit or heat is matching. Uh, check out your damn radio. Uh, uh, I mean, there's free study materials. You can see the technicians like that. I think it's really easy and there's three different levels and you can understand some and it costs you almost nothing. Yeah. I, I hope what I said today was complimentary and not, you know, like, oh, that's not the way I learned it in a course. So. No, I, 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 I have taken no course. So <laughs> I, 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 I learned this basic uh, like how to, what it We, we as a company need to do a better 